Hello folks. So this is going to be a Unite Now webinar on the Unity input system. And this webinar is going to be a bit different to the last time we spoke about the input system in that it's going to focus on workflow tips and feature integrations. The last webinar that we did, which was Meet the Developers, covered more of the fundamentals of the input system and showed how to set up a base sort of character interaction system where you could run around and you could attack with a sword. And you can watch that on the Unity YouTube channel. So my name is Andy Touch. I'm a senior content developer at Unity Technologies. And my job is to basically use Unity and use the new features that come with the, um, the engine and demonstrate how they're made, make examples, and show you how you can use Unity in your own projects. As a summary, Unity has a new-ish input system. I say new-ish because it's actually been verified um, package or a verified feature for a little while now. And it's our solution to setting up cross-platform input for Unity projects. It's a verified package in Unity 2019 LTS. And it comprises of several things, such as an asset, an interface, component, and API workflows. As you can see here in these screenshots, on the far left, we can see here that we have uh, we can create a input actions asset. This asset then has an interface, um, a window which allows you to set up your control schemes, such as player menu vehicle controls, what actions those contain, such as the player has movement and attack, and vehicles could have accelerate and steer. And then you can use a player input component which takes these actions and then instances them in the scene. And then once it instances them in the scene, and it can be read at runtime, you can then apply that to your game. For example, if you had an attack action, you can use a player input component in a scene to register when that attack is taking place, and then apply some code to it, such as swing a sword on a character or play a sound effect. I've created an example project called Warriors, and this is available today publicly on GitHub, and there's a link at the bottom. And Warriors is an example project which covers a wide variety of different uses of Unity's input system. And this ranges from cross-platform input, such as uh, game pads on console, keyboard and mouse, and touchscreen, all the way through to rebinding UI. And I'm going to be using this Warriors project in this webinar to demonstrate several workflow features that I'm going to cover, um, from feature integrations, such as UGUI and Cinemachine, to also how to do things like rebind UI and detect when a, a gamepad is unplugged and replugged again. If I now switch over to Unity, um, let's take a look at this project. So when you download the project, you have this example scene, which has several different components or several different objects in the hierarchy. We have this centralized game manager, which allows you to switch between single player and local multiplayer mode. In single player, when you click play, you'll be able to take control of this warrior character. And using keyboard, you'll be able to move around and also swing your sword. This character controller is driven using the Unity input system. So here we have player controls, which has actions for movement, look, attack, and toggling a pause, like so. And then each of these actions then is comprised of several different bindings because you may create a game for cross-platform, one that runs on a touchscreen, one that runs on different forms of consoles, desktop, VR, kind of anything that you want to target. And movement has a binding of WSD, so arrow keys, so I'm controlling it with a keyboard like so to move the character around, and also a binding of a left stick of a gamepad. So if I pick up this PlayStation controller, I can then control the character using the exact same code base. I haven't actually changed any of the code to say, if using PlayStation do this, it's all automatic. It's all pretty generic in the code. It just takes whatever gamepad is set up here, whatever input device is set up here, and funnels it in. And I can even pick up an Xbox controller, and it'll, the UI will now update, and run around with that as well. So it's very automatic. It switches gamepads very easily, and you can create all kinds of different action maps, actions, and bind it to all kinds of different devices. As mentioned earlier, the previous Unite Now webinar 
covers a lot of this setup. So I went through the process of creating an action map, actually setting up these actions and these bindings, and then actually hooking that into the code. So you can watch that video to uh, go over that if you're not familiar with the system, or you can continue watching this video to see how the input system fits into different workflows and scenarios um, that you may come across, or you probably will come across when creating your games and projects. This Warriors project also includes a local multiplayer mode. So this takes this Warrior uh, prefab instance and it spawns using instantiate multiple at runtime. So as I hit play, it takes that Warrior that's in the scene, removes it, and actually spawns four instances it from a prefab. And each of these has that player, player input component, as you can see here. And each of them is using this very same input actions asset, but it's instead getting the events of these different bindings and actions and using them locally. So using the new uh, the Unity input system, you can not only set up very visually these, uh, these inputs and these bindings, but you can also use it very flexibly to create things like local multiplayer. So I can move using my keyboard keys, I can run around with the keyboard and also the PlayStation controller. I'm doing this all by myself. Um, so it's a bit tricky to run around with these characters. I need, need more hands and fingers, um, as you can see in this project. So you can create local multiplayer, you can create cross-platform uh, control schemes, you can create them more visually as well. Let's cut back to the slides. So as I said, you can actually download that project now. It's public. I'm going to keep updating and improving this project. So you might see that there is a version one for the previous webinar. Um, version two for this webinar, and I'll be doing bug fixes and things. So if you find any issues, you can um, file them as an issue, and then I'll look into it. Um, and I'll also be adding extra features and functionality in this example scenario as they are released with the, with the input system in future releases. So let's talk about one of these scenarios. And this one is switching control styles. So in a typical game, you'll have a set of controls. In this case, character controls. And this is a reference from Grand Theft Auto V made by Rockstar Games. This is not a Unity project, but I'll be using it as a example scenario. So in a game like this, you would have a set of character controls where you use a joystick to move around, use perhaps the X button to jump, use a trigger to aim. Uh, you may use another trigger button to shoot. You have this kind of control scheme for third person on foot um, control scheme. But then in most games, you often have other types of control schemes that you'll switch to at runtime or when you go between different scenes and scenarios. So in this particular game, you can switch from this on foot controls to vehicle controls. And obviously you come into some complexity here. The X button on character controls could be a jump, but the X button on a um, vehicle controls will be an accelerate. So you've got very different types of functionality um, in play, but obviously one is but using the same um, input method on your device. And this obviously grows in complexity as you add more different types of control styles. So you not only have on foot controls, uh, vehicle controls, but also UI controls. So an X button, which would be jump in character, accelerate on a, in a vehicle, would in UI be very different and would actually just accept or confirm a button or an option that you've selected in the UI. And this obviously increases for other things such as um, inventory systems, uh, weapon selection, uh, settings menu, if you have other types of vehicles, it, the list goes on. So how do you sort of set up in the Unity input system different types of control schemes and switch between them easily? So in the input action assets, you can create a series of different action maps. So as you can see here on the left, we have player controls, menu controls, vehicle controls, and a couple of different scenarios. And on that player input component, which is basically the instance in the scene of this input actions asset, you can set a default map. So this is basically what the player input is gonna start with when you run the game or you run the scene. In this case, player controls. And of course, you can switch this between different maps. For example, most games start up with a UI menu, not necessarily directly in gameplay. So you could have the default map as being menu controls to start with. And each of these action maps can have different sets of actions. 
As you can see here, player controls at the top has movement, look, attack, and toggle pause. And these are all contextual based on player controls. Now, menu controls don't have the same actions. They have things like navigate, left click, pointer, submit, cancel, things to do with navigating UI, which I'll go into a little bit later on. So they are very different types of actions, but you might have similar bindings. For example, a movement of a character will use a left stick on a gamepad to run around. Whereas navigating through the UI or navigating through a menu will also use the gamepad left stick as well. You have a lot of crossover in different types of bindings. So once you have your um, different action map set up, Via this API, it's very simple. We can reference the player input component, and you can use switch current action map to switch to the action map. It's very simple and very straightforward. So after you set this up, you can then switch to it and then bring in the actions as they're happening and apply it to your game code. Now, if I switch back to this Warriors project, I use exactly this to switch between player controls, which is the warrior running around and attacking, and menu controls to navigate through a different UI. So as I hit the play button, we spawn all these different instances of these warriors. I pick up the PlayStation controller. This warrior is currently using the player controls action map. However, when I push the start button, which is this little toggle pause um, option here, start gamepad or P on a keyboard, it basically switches the warrior to use the menu controls action map. And if I pause, it then switches back. You can actually preview this happening directly inside this input debug window. So if I navigate to the um, uh, instance of player input that's using the DualShock controller, which is this one here, user one, and open up the actions, where you'll notice that we've got the set of player actions for movement, look, and attack, and toggle pause. And then we've got the menu ones, which are disabled. And notice as I pause the game, it, it disables the player controls and switches to the menu controls. This is using an API called, um, I think it's active or deactivate um, input controls. So using that API of switch current action map, you can actually switch between these different uh, control schemes. And using that activate and deactivate player input, you can also uh, turn on different sets on and off. The next scenario I want to talk about is navigating UI interfaces. In this specific, uh, specific case, it's Yugi, Unity's UI system. So in a typical UI system, you often have lots of many different uh, buttons, sliders, toggles, and elements on the screen. In this specific reference, which is Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild by Nintendo, this isn't a Unity game, but it's a great example of having explicit navigation for a list. So you push up on your gamepad, um, or your arrow keys, and it basically navigates up a list or down a list, pushing uh, right and left um, or down, and you navigate through directional navigation, such as like a grid of buttons, uh, a grid of items. This is quite typical in an RPG. And also a typical button press, where you select a certain uh, option, or you hover over it with your mouse, and you click it, and you sort of confirm it. So this is pretty typical. Most games have this type of UI style navigation. And of course, how do we actually um, set this up to work in Unity, especially to make it cross-platform and especially to navigate these different UI interfaces depending on what type of device you have selected? So if I go to this menu controls action map, which I showed you a little bit earlier on, there's a series of actions I've already set up. Navigate, left click, point, submit, cancel, and toggle pause. And this is just a couple that you could have. And you'll notice that I've set up a range of different bindings for each type of action. So navigating the UI, will, you can navigate through arrow keys, WSD keys, D-pad on a gamepad, uh, gamepad left stick, and gamepad right stick. And you also have elements such as submit and cancel, which would be like an X button or a pause button. And if you use the Unity UI system, you have this thing called an event system, which handles all the events that are currently being processed and applies it to the UI. And with this, you can have an input module. And when you install the, um, the input system package, 
it basically comes with this input module that you can assign. And you have this very attractively named input system UI input module, which will pop up as an option or is automatic, depending on your version of Unity, alongside the event system. What you'll notice in here is that you can then choose an action asset to assign to it, in this case, input actions. And you can correspond these bindings to different options to navigate the UI. Now, if you actually create an, uh, an event system from scratch, or you assign this input system UI input module component, there's already a default input action asset set up for all of this. But I want to show you in this webinar how you can use a custom action map, in this case, this menu controls, and apply it to certain options. And you can see here, navigate to move around the UI and select different options is associated with move. And submit is associated with submit as well. Now, once you have this set up, so all this data from the um, action asset is fed into the event system, it then automatically works with things such as uh, interactable uh, components. So the best example is a button. Um, when you navigate and you highlight a button, it switches to a highlighted color. Um, when you click a button or you submit, it will um, process this on-click event. And it factors in stuff like the navigation. So you have a horizontal, vertical, and automatic navigation. Now, I might be overcomplicating things, but this just happens automatically. It's basically saying that as long as this is all set up in the event system from this input action asset, it'll work automatically with interactable elements such as buttons, sliders, scroll bars, and things like that in the Unity um, GUI, uh, UGUI system. So if I switch over to Unity, let's show that in work. So if I go over to my event system, you notice here that I've already got the input actions set up from that input action asset. But if I added this input system UI input module, so imagine I'm just adding like a brand new one from scratch. We've got here this default input actions, which is already set up with all the different things like UI point and click. So you don't actually have to create this brand new action map. You can just add this component and it's all automatically set up for you. But of course, in this demo, I want to show you how you can use your custom sort of actions or the, your own specific action map. Now, if I switch to the game manager and go to single player and click play, obviously, you can run around with my character. And when I push that toggle pause option in player controls, I'll then switch into the UI. And as I move up and down with my joystick, I can navigate between these different elements. And I can press the X button to confirm and choose these different types of panels. And I can also navigate left and right to move to this rebind control system. If I switch over to my keyboard and I pause the game, I can actually use up and down in the WSD and arrow keys and enter to have basically the same functionality. And in the code, I haven't actually changed anything or done anything you know, exotic or unique. As long as that event system has these actions and these bindings all set up, it will just work automatically with the Unity UI system. They also detect um, mouse hover over states and also things like if you built to a touchscreen device, you know, tap is a submit or a, or a left click and your finger is where the um, pointer would be. So that's the Unity UI system in a nutshell in how the input system can tie into it. Controlling Cine Machine. So in most games, you often have a camera that follows a particular target. Most cases is a character, but it also could be a vehicle or kind of anything that's tracked in the scene. And in this particular scenario of it, say like an orbit camera, you have this camera that follows this character, but you also control it. So you have that automatic element of it following and being a certain distance from your character that's moving around, but you also control it. So you push left or some kind of X input and it orbits around the character, but then you have some value in the Y axis, which is then going to move the camera up and down, not flip over entirely, but it's going to go up to a certain uh, top degree and to a certain lower degree, whereas the X is more freeform. So this is a typical orbit camera setup. Now you want to take your X and Y data, which is probably going to be a mouse and joystick or a mouse and joystick here, um, 
that joystick could be on a gamepad or could be a virtual uh, joystick as well. You want to feed that into Cinemachine. So Unity's camera system, Cinemachine, does a lot of this stuff automatically. But you need to feed your data from the input system and from your actions and bindings directly into these values. So I won't go through all these elements of Cinemachine. I'll just go through the scenario that's in this Warriors project, um, which you can download and dissect a lot further yourself. But in Cinemachine, when you install it and you have this uh, list of different types of cameras, if you go to a free look camera, it will create this kind of like free look sort of camera uh, circular or spherical rig. And you've got tons of options here. I'm not going to go through all of them. But the main ones that you want to have a look at is Y and X here. So the X axis value is going to orbit the camera around the warrior or around your car or spaceship or whatever it may be. And the Y value is going to move it up and down on this um, bar. So when you push, say, like a joystick up, it's going to go to the top or it's going to go down, depending if you're one of those people who likes inverted control schemes or not. So you need to get your data from your um, mouse or your finger or your uh, left stick gamepad or uh, your, your D-pad on your gamepad as well and feed it into this X and Y value. So how do you get data from this? So here we have this action called look and look gets the uh, bindings of delta of the mouse so as the mouse moves in a particular direction on the screen and also the right stick of a game of any gamepad, whether it's PlayStation, Nintendo, or, or Xbox, or sort of any other gamepad that is compatible with the input system. So how do we actually get this look action and assign it to these values? Because look is going to return a vector two over which direction the keys are being pushed. So we want to take the Y and the X from vector two and feed it into these values. So Cinemachine automatically has a component that you can use that does this. And this is called the Cinemachine Input Provider. You can obviously open up the script and see what it does inside. But what it does is it allows you to assign an action with, say, a vector2 um, or a compatible kind of uh, set of data and feed it into the x, y axis and also the z axis. And when the Cinemachine Input Provider is attached to a Cinemachine camera, it will feed that data in automatically. So you don't have to write any extra code or do anything like that. You can just add this component, point it from look or whatever your desired action is into here, and then it will feed it to this Y and this X value. So I go into the Warriors project, and in single player, you'll notice that there is a single player camera of stationary which when I enter play mode, the virtual Cinemachine camera is just stationary. The character runs around, and this would be kind of similar to a local multiplayer game like uh, Mario Party or uh, Overcooked or something like that. But if I switch from stationary to follow and orbit and enter, enter play mode, it's actually going to use a Cinemachine free look camera. And you can actually go to the uh, camera section and select them here and be able to view this free look and see all the settings I've already set. Again, I'm not going to go through all of them because they'll <laughs> take a couple of hours and I'm supposed to be focusing on input. So what we've got here is we've got our warrior and notice it's using the keyboard. So the UI is displaying what, what current input device it's using. And as I move my cursor to the left and right of the screen and up and down, it's basically applying that logic to that um, to that uh, Cinemachine data. Now, if I pick up, uh, if I push the arrow keys, it's then going to obviously move around the character, but that Cinemachine um, sort of look of me moving around with the, um, the mouse position, or if I go down to the player controls, the uh, delta mouse position is basically going to look in the direction that I want. So it's tying that, that input into Cinemachine. Now, if I pick up my PlayStation controller and run around, obviously left stick applies to the movement. Now move my right stick. As you can see, the right stick is tied to that look action. You'll notice it's actually applying the same logic. So if I push up and down with right stick, it's then going to move the tilt in Y. Now if I push right and left um, with the joystick, it's actually going to rotate the, uh, the camera. And of course, if I pick up my Xbox controller, it's going to do the exact same logic as well. So this is how you would sort of get data from this uh, input system and the actions and feed it directly into um, Cinemachine. So you'll notice here, actually, if I run around and as I move 
um, the camera and settings, you'll notice that these input access values are actually changing. So it's, you can see that the data is actually being fed in uh, from the input system into Cinemachine. Switch back to the slides. Runtime rebinding. So this was a big um, request or a big scenario. Um, I've got to mention that basically all of these um, scenarios are ones that I've kind of read online or read on the forums or read in YouTube comments or read on Twitter. It's kind of key common things that are popping up. And this, this list is by no means every request or every element in the grand scheme of input because that's <laughs> that's a very, very long list. But these are kind of like the main big ones that I can tackle and then in the future, hopefully tackle other ones. And one of the main big questions was how do we set up runtime rebinding with the Unity input system? So as an example, in the recently released Spelunky 2 by Moss Mouth, it's a game I've been playing quite a lot recently and, and I love it and enjoy it. Um, but pretty much any game released on console or, or a major release on, on Steam or sort of any other platform will have some kind of runtime rebinding like this. You obviously have a list of different controls for different things. So jump is X, um, attack is square, bomb is circle, triangle is rope, and things like that. And most of these games, or I think pretty much all of them on console as well, um, will have some kind of rebind system. So this means that you can take the instance of jump, which is X, so you push X to make the character jump through the air. It's kind of self-explanatory. You can then uh, rebind that or listen out for another button to use, because maybe you don't want to use X. Maybe you want to use right trigger or you want to use left trigger. Or maybe you're using a control that's more suited for accessibility. Um, obviously, we have PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo controllers, but there's many more different types of controllers out there, including ones that allow for better accessibility for people who may not be able to use these controllers in um, the same way as other people. So maybe you want to rebind jump to something that's a lot, little easier to push or, or is a lot suited for your hands or your input method you're going to use. So runtime rebinding is very important to make your games more dynamic, but also make them more appliable and controllable by many more people out there. So in this, in this workflow, you have three steps. One is whatever the um, binding currently is. In this case, jump is X. Two is jump, and it's listening out for a button to re be rebound to. Next is jump, and it's, in this scenario, it's been set to R2. And you obviously have the scenario where you have, you have to support many different types of controllers. So this is just three of them, but there's many more out there. So obviously jump is Z on a keyboard, Xbox is A, and, and jump is X in, in Spelunky 2. And obviously this multiplies greater and further to many other platforms. And the solution for this is actually a relatively straightforward and simple API in Unity, Unity's input system that allows you to Bind sort of any sort of input to any other input on your device using interactive rebinding. So let's take the scenario of attack. Um, and in this scenario, this code is in, or the subset of this code, or a variation of this code is in the Warriors project. So you can actually download it and see how, how I've set it up. So in this case, we have an action map of player controls, and we have an attack action. And the attack action is a button. So when you push a button, the character will attack and swing their sword. So you want to rebind this to different things. And we have this API, which uses a uh, input action rebinding extension of a rebinding operation. And start interactive rebind, that's just a custom method. So this could be when you push a button in the UI or you open up some kind of menu. And you create a new rebind action. And with this, you assign the input action, in this case, this attack. You perform the interactive rebinding, and on complete, you will then run, um, you'll then trigger rebind completed, and it will start the rebind operation. So when this code runs, it will basically listen out for your next input on your device. So if you have a PlayStation controller and X is for attack, it will listen out for if you say push R3 or L1 or sort of any other type of input. And then once that operation has been completed, so you push another button, it will then dispose of that rebind operation. And then here you can then apply your changes. So obviously when you change your binding to something else, you want to say, um, hey, update the UI to be a different icon or say rebind completed or something like that. 
So you take your input action and via code, you can then say, get input action and assign it to here. Kind of, kind of like how the Cine machine was taking that look action and applying it to the Cine machine data there. This is basically doing the same thing, but just using it in a different way. Now we have this start interactive rebind, but there's a couple of scenarios you might run into. And that's if you, you can accidentally bind it to different things that you don't want to. So let's take the scenario of an attack. Now you probably don't want attack to be bound to a mouse position movement, which might happen if you're rebinding. You know, it's very easy for someone to grab the mouse and move it around to um, pause music or to pause the game or something. So then that would detect that the mouse is the interactive um, device that's, mo that's moved. So then every time you're going to move your mouse, your character is going to attack, which is going to, it doesn't look right. Obviously, you don't want to bind it to things like start. So using with controls excluder, you could say, don't rebind it to mouse position and don't rebind it to start because then it's going to be very diff difficult for you to fix the rebind if you're trying to start, push start to start to pause the game, and then you're just going to be attacking all the time. And the same with like keyboard P, which could be like pause, or keyboard escape, which is usually saved for you know exiting the game or pausing. There may be some very specific controls you don't want to rebind your action to. So hit with this, you can use with controls excluding. And here we use an on match wait for another 0.1 seconds. So it's kind of like waiting for like a little duration of time before it runs the on complete and then you can then apply it. So you can use the pretty standard rebind code. It's, it's very simple, very straightforward. And it's actually documented as well. So you can look there for some more examples. But you can also use some extra um, elements of the API to exclude some sort of use cases you might run into or some bugs you might run into. So let's switch over to the warrior system and see how this works. And for this, I'm gonna go into local multiplayer mode. So if I run around my keyboard and I push P, which basically switches from action map player controls to menu controls, I can then come to this UI, again, using that event system to um, control it. And here we have this simple rebind UI. And here it's going to display the binding name, in this case, attack, um, which is this one here. Here is the current key, which is E to attack. And we can inspect and say, yep, E is attack. And then I can click it. And if I click that button, it's then going to go to that uh, custom method start interactive rebind, and it's now listening out for rebind. And okay, I can I can move the mouse, but I'm going to push another key on my keyboard. Let's do right control, and it then on complete updates the UI, and now right control is active. So now if I run around, and hit right control. Obviously, you can't see it right now. You just have to take my word for it. I can push right control, and it's going to attack. Similarly, I can then open this up and let's do something like, I don't know, um, backspace, right? Obviously, <laughs> it's such a ridiculous scenario, but it's basically demonstrating that you can set up this interactive rebinding using this very small bit of code for different things. So maybe attack is uh, L, right? And then use L for the attack. Now, that's great on a keyboard, but what about on a gamepad? So I've picked up the PlayStation controller, and I'm going to pause the game and go back to rebind controls. What you'll notice here is currently it's bound to X, and it's displaying a little icon. And it's displaying that icon because I've created a very simple tool, which basically takes in the binding. So you take the binding, which is currently active, in this case, uh, button south on the gamepad, it's then going to this tool. It then goes to a binding set, and it basically says button south is this icon here, PS4 cross, now display this icon. This isn't specific to the input system other than taking bindings and assigning them here, but it's a tool you can extract for your own projects. But I'm using this here to demonstrate how you could tap into data from the uh, input system and then build a tool around this. So if I now, select this um, button and hit X. It's now listening out for another input on my uh, controller. So let's do like R2 and unpause the game. If I now have press R2, you can probably hear me <laughs> moving the trigger, is then going to do an attack. And it remembers that. And this is applying it to the player input. So if I find the player input for the uh, PlayStation controller, which is this one here, it's applying that rebind or that override to that player input. 
So this being rebound to R2 is different to the keyboard that's being rebound to L or backspace or whatever it was. You obviously also have the beauty of being able to bind to anything you want. So I could bind this to like the share button if I really wanted to, which doesn't make sense in the grand scheme of an attack or maybe even the touchpad. So now when I leave the game, the touchpad is now being used to, to attack. Of course, something a bit more traditional, which is, you know, R3 and then that can attack. Now, if I pick up the Xbox controller, obviously, as that's a different player input and a different type of device, it's no longer a, a X square triangle circle. Um, Microsoft obviously uses A, B, X, and Y. I can then change this to say like a Y to attack. And then the Y to attack on this Xbox uh, player, if I switch to the other one, I'm juggling all these devices on my desk. That's obviously an A still because it's overriding that player input. So each player can set up their own control schemes and their own uh, their own um, input sets, and then it's going to apply it to that player input. Now I'm using here 2019.4 LTS and um, input system 1.0.0 um, package. I've heard that 1.1 package has a API to be able to take these rebind um, inputs and be able to export it to JSON. So you'll be able to export it. So when you like leave the game or you want to share input maps, you can then leave and reload it. This is not currently in the Warriors project, but I'm looking into updating it to make use of this API soon. So I wanted to just let you know that that API is there if you use 1.1 and you'll be able to make use, use of it um, using this Interactive Rebind uh, API. Device Disconnect Reconnect. So this is kind of a strange scenario in where it's not the most, I guess, interest. it's not as interesting as Cinemachine or navigating UI and thinking on local multiplayer and things like this, but it's a needed thing to sort of fix or solve, especially if you're going to make local multiplayer games. So this is a scenario where you have three players and they all have their own gamepad. And this could be wired or wireless. Then let's say player two's gamepad becomes disconnected. And this could happen through, it runs out of batteries or it's unplugged or something like this happens or it breaks. But then you reconnect it. You go to the store, you buy new batteries or you re-plug re it into your uh, computer or games console and then you reconnect. So you need to detect that these events happen. So when the disconnect happens, you want to pause the game, throw up some UI and say, hey, player two is disconnected, reconnect and things like this. And obviously when you reconnect, you want to say player two, you know, batteries are now plugged in, something like this, press A to continue because you don't want player two to be in a disadvantage in a racing game or a fighting game or something like that. So the way that you can detect that this happens is through the player input component. So as, we, as I mentioned earlier on, each player or each player in a local multiplayer situation would have a player input component. And the player input would detect when a disconnect happens, but also when a controller has been regained as well. And this is through an API called device lost and device regained. And on the player input, when you set up your Unity events or uh, send message or your behavior, you can then assign an event here. So it's basically going to trigger when device lost happens and when device regained happens as well. And it's just a method like this on device lost. Um, in the Warriors project, it actually updates the visuals. So the character will have a gray beard and it will say disconnected or um, if I remember correctly. And then on device regained, it's then going to wait for the device to be regained because obviously when you plug in a controller, it has to like the OS or the, it has to detect that it's plugged in and it's a val value control. It doesn't happen instantly. It happens after like, you know, a second or two. And then once that regained is finished, it, you can then sort of unpause the UI or, or do, do something. In the Warriors case, it then recolors them to whatever the device is that you've plugged it in. So now switch back to Unity and make sure in local multiplayer. So we've got here our uh, characters. And if I select one of them, let's select the uh, Xbox character. We've got or one of the Xbox uh, people. I think this, this one selected is player three. You notice here we've got device lost, device regained, and also controls change. So if we switch from an Xbox controller to say a PlayStation controller, 
obviously this this would happen on a uh, on a PC, not necessarily on say an Xbox uh, console. Um, so we have here on device lost, which will then basically go to the code and say, hey, display this new de device lost UI. And on device regain is then going to detect it again. So if I now go to the Xbox uh, controller and I'm going to unplug it from my computer. So I've now unplugged it. Did I unplug it? And I unplugged the wrong thing. One sec. OK, I've unplugged the right thing now. So I've unplugged the, uh, the Xbox controller. Obviously, the other things are still, the other warriors are controllable, and I can run around with them. Um, but you notice that it's a disconnected, and the character's sort of gone gray, and it's displayed that UI above the head, and I can't control it. But the game is still active, and the game is still running. So if I now replug in that Xbox controller, after a split second, it'll then be detected to pick up. Now, I can also do things like, Unplug the PlayStation controller. So unplug it, and this is big white. Unplug the Xbox controller, and now I can re-plug in the PlayStation controller, and it's going to remember that that was player two. So it's not going to override the PlayStation to the Xbox controller. It's very smart in sort of remembering what was disconnected and what was regained. So something that was quite troublesome or quite a bit of a headache to sort out in the past with um, the input manager. Um, it's actually pretty simple and it took me, I guess, an hour or two to set up this whole device loss, device regain system and make sure it was all working uh, great. I actually probably took less time because it, the API is so automatic. So you can now sort of detect when these things disconnect and regained. And obviously in this scenario, it just recolors the character, but you could throw up a pause menu. You could say player four is disconnected and things like that. So that's the end of the presentation. And I'd like to thank you for watching this and tuning in. Um, as a note, so this project was using 2019 uh, LTS, 2019.4, and the input system package 1.0, which is verified for 2019 LTS and newer versions like 2020.1, 2020.2, and things like that. The input system package 1.1 is in preview for Unity 2019 LTS and newer as well. And that has more features and functionality um, added on top of what I showed you today. We have a lot more information on this input system landing page, such as links to um, eventually this webinar, but then the previous input system webinar where we met with Rene and Will and spoke about different thing, different designs and functionality of the input system, plus a variety of other uh, examples and content on there. And you can also download this Warriors example project. So everything I showed you now is in this GitHub repository, and it will be on branch v2. And the reason why I've set up a different branch is for different snapshots for this project. So I created this project originally um, around the time of the first Unite Now input system webinar called Meet the Devs. And I branched that off as v1, because if people watch that, watch that webinar, they want to get the project at that state which is fine. But since then, I've actually improved it, fixed bugs, added extra functionality, tidied the code, made it a lot, a lot more optimized. Um, and for that, I've then branched it as v2. So you can download this project webinar as of v2, which will basically be as it is of this video. But if you download master um, or main and on GitHub, you'll then get you know, the, the newer version with, with other bug fixes. So. Uh, take note when you're downloading this project of which version you're going to be downloading from there. If I now switch over to uh, GitHub, I can then show you that we basically got this uh, project um, on GitHub. Um, and I've written some elements of what it shows, some parts you've already seen, some parts you maybe haven't seen, uh, maybe, maybe I haven't shown. And also some other features it uses, like tone mapping and nested UIs for the input device. And you're more than welcome to take this project, learn from it, extract code from it, um, build on top of it if you want. But I kind of see it as a learning resource where people can dip into the code and dip into different functions and say, oh, how do they display the UI above the player's heads and things like that, and be able to extract it for your own projects. If you do that, definitely contact me because I, I I really enjoy sort of seeing how people use our example content and how we can actually improve it for the future. So my email is in this GitHub repository in the README here. 
And just to summarize, uh, thank you for attending this uh, Unite Now webinar. I hope it is useful and I hope it will be helpful for your projects, whether you're going to input the implement the input system or solving typical, typical scenarios in um, creating games. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you.